Looking for the skills and training you need to get a new career? Call CTC, the Center for Training and Careers, and start working towards that new career today. Call CTC in San Jose. I'm Siwapili Rose Amador, and this is Native Voice TV. Welcome to the show. Today we have with us Ali Painted Crow. Welcome, Ali. Thank you, Siwapili. And Ali is Yaki, and Ali is a veteran of the military. Tell us about your experience. Well, thank you, Siwapili. Um, I am retired 22 years, and uh, my last tour was in Iraq, and I've spent the last five years uh, traveling through the United States. Um, trying to educate communities about um, newly returned soldiers, you know, military people, and, and the struggles that families have um, when they do come back. And so that's what I've been doing the last five years is sort of advocating for people that um, deal with the military. And you had a difficult time, and a lot of others have as well. Tell us about some of the experiences. Actually, yeah, um, there's really a lot of challenges in coming home, uh, in dealing with people, in dealing with uh, PTSD that um, is talked about more now than when I first came back. And especially for women, who because there is an assumption that women um, are not in the front lines and what they don't, people don't understand is the front lines is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, many women are coming back with PTSD and a lot of challenges with family, with children, mm -hmm. things like that. So um, I've spent um, a good portion of the time actually going to universities and talking with students um, in different capacities about some of those challenges and some of those struggles around um, what to expect and how to, how to uh, you know, educate the community. Now, the last time you were on, you told us about some of the experiences you had there, but you've done, so, you've learned more, a lot more things that have gone on with people since your last visit. Tell us about some of those things. Yeah, um, the VA is really working hard to, you know, deal with um, the normal uh, veteran that returns. Um, one of the challenges that I am finding is that mm -hmm. uh, Native veterans are really struggling uh, quite a bit more in terms of services, quite a bit more in terms of um, access, dialogue, um, just the differences in approach that sometimes needs to happen with, you know, Native vets and mm -hmm. the spiritual aspect that's missing from the VA that um, at one time was there for some of the some of the VA sites, but doesn't seem to be there now. And so there's a really big gap and fragmentation in terms of actually helping Native uh, veterans and their families. Why do you think that's changed or things have, um, are not available anymore? Well, I don't know how much has changed because I've only accessed the VA in the last five years and where mm -hmm. I live, um, they really don't promote that as a matter of fact. Um, one, it, one staff person called Native spirituality and the practice of it sort of a myth or a lore, and that was, you know, quite shocking to hear that that was the thought of, you know, how mm -hmm. we call our spirit back to heal ourselves um, as not being real mm -hmm. for many of the VA uh, employees or just the thinking of the VA in itself. I know that Menlo Park used to have a... Um, a sweat lodge, but it's right. been taken down and there's, there's been a struggle to bring that up. You know, one of the challenges that I'm facing personally right now is that um, in 2009 I was, um, I was invited to be part of a project to write my story in a book called The Lonely Soldier written by a journalist by the name of Helen Benedict. Mm -hmm. And I thought it would be a good thing in terms of educating people and talking about, you know, I was the only Native woman mm -hmm. in the book. And as it turns out that the book has been quite exploited um, to the degree that um, they're using my story to at, at the Columbia University to do a, re oh, they did it actually, I couldn't stop it. A research project in, entailed 400 students to assess, um, do an intervention and do a diagnosis and treatment plan for me with my <laughs> picture, with my name oh my. Uh, to be available for public. 
uh, viewing. And so I found that quite shocking that in 2011, that Native people are still being used as research projects without permission from the person who's being researched. And Did so, they do that on everyone in the book or no, just you? No, only me. And they said that I was picked because I was a Native woman. So um, I'm really shocked that the university and Ivy League you know, university would still consider it not important to contact me and let me know that this is going on. And what I am finding in, in doing that and having gone to New York, try to talk to them, them not listening to me, um, half of the students were appalled and tried to um, reject the project and they were told if they didn't do it, they wouldn't graduate. So there was just a big to do right now and it's still in the process of figuring out what to do next. Um, but what, what I learned about for myself is that it's happening in a lot of other universities as well. Oh, really? Yeah. And the other thing that's happening is veterans are being discriminated against in the schools. And um, I think a lot of you it mean is... as far as using benefits? or As far as being students, oh. yes. Um, and because students are not educated in terms of a vet coming back and going into school. Um, I believe one student was, he was an Iraq veteran, he was heckled there at the University of Columbia as well by his peers, by students, because he was trying to tell a story of which people really didn't understand. And so there needed to be an education uh, within the school system, within the staff system, within, you know, people mm -hmm. just aren't aware and a lot of not good things are happening to veterans and they're being discouraged in terms of um, of participating in you know the educational system we're not just returning you know we're not just returning back into community we're we're returning in a lot of different ways with a lot of different problems and we just really need to to educate I'm going to ask you to share a quick story and because because I thought it was so appalling that you shared with us last time when you were in the military and they referred to enemy territory? Yes. I was at a briefing um, while I was stationed in Iraq and a couple of uh, E-5s came in who had just been briefed by the, one of the commanders. Um, and in that briefing, one of the things that they said is they called uh, enemy ter territory Indian country. And I'm standing there in total disbelief here I am wearing the same uniform, you know, um, listening to this briefing, and I'm standing there being called the enemy. And um, I mean, they quiet him down, but th that's just goes to show what the thinking still is across the board when they think of enemy, we're still the enemy. So well, I, in I, my I, mind, you know, that's mm -hmm. how it felt to me at that moment. And that has never left me, you know, it really put a sour, a sour, bitter taste in my mind, in my mouth, and in my career of 22 years of like, wow, I've done this, and well, in the I end, act, this is uh -huh. what I get. You know? I actually thought of you when they were talking about getting Bin Laden, and they were referring to him as Geronimo. Yeah, yeah, I read that, and I just thought, wow, they couldn't pick a better code name. I mean, mm -hmm. they, I mean, that's also very telling of where mm -hmm. we sit as a people in this nation, even though we per capita are the highest who enlist in the military um, around the nation. You know, we're, we're like 3% of the population and, and um, I think the highest percentage in terms of who enlists in the military, we're still seen as the enemy. Yeah. And if people pay attention, you will see that continuously in a lot of the statements that are being made, absolutely. And, so I'm striving right now to mm -hmm. sort of bring a voice to Columbia University and, and, and you know, ask Native, the Native community to, to email them and let them know mm -hmm. this is not okay stuff. You know, Columbia, it's not okay to do it in 2011, to do research projects on Native people just because you think you can and that nobody Sounds will Sounds interesting, anything. huh? Yeah, well, I, it's not new, I guess. It happens over and over and mm -hmm. over. And I have so many stories to tell about women Native women who um, experience these things on a lot of different levels in a lot of different places. Where should they write? Well, they can write to Columbia EDU, uh, Department of Social Work. Dean Takamura is a person who uh, refused to, um, to stop the project. 
and also the journalist Helen Benedict who mm -hmm. is a journalist there so they can write to Helen Benedict at, C at Columbia University okay. um, to, and, and the dean there for, for journalism. And I, you know, it would be great for them to know that the Native community will, you know, it's not going to allow say this to happen without saying something to them. And we're just looking into, you know, what else can be done? How can we prevent mm -hmm. this from happening to the vets that are coming behind us, to Native people who have a story to tell and, and it not be exploited, you know, right. in such a way that's harmful. To face more discrimination yes. after contributing like that. And ho hopefully our viewers will email, write, and oppose this kind of research being done. Yeah, I think that it's very, um, you know, there's a lot of students wrote tons of emails, professors from all, mm -hmm. even from Canada, were writing appalled by this action. They had plenty of time to stop it. They had plenty of time to renegotiate the project. Um, and they refused to even have a conversation with me around that until like the day before. And so um, we're just trying to take measures to keep the message going that this isn't okay. Um, I will be building a website. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like yet, but you know, um, I'm going to be inviting um, mm -hmm. Native community to tell their stories of discrimination, not just in the university, but in their mm -hmm. lives, you know, and, and just bring some awareness that it's still happening. Maybe it's a little more subtle, but it's still happening. Doesn't seem very subtle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you've been involved in other projects, you said as well? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I think is really important that I have learned in the last five years is I started, a, I, I wanted to be in a peaceful place when I came back. And so I tried joining, you know, peace organizations, except the problem that I found is that they weren't very peaceful. Mm -hmm. So instead, um, I started an organization called Tur Turtle Women Rising, and that they can find the website at turtlewomenrising.com. Mm -hmm. And it's women stepping up for the planet, women stepping up with the drum, and I know that a lot of communities have a hard time with women drumming. And so I try to tell the story of the drum, that the drum was made for and given to men so that they could understand life and feel the heartbeat. And because of all of the the violence against children and against women and against, you know, um, the earth, that mm -hmm. women are just stepping up and, and, and taking that drum and, and you know, um, bringing life back into that. And it's not taking it away from men, it's just um, connecting it more to the people, you know. And so we have a, a group of women from all over the United States who meet once a year. This year we're meeting in Olympia, Washington in front oh. of the Capitol for four days and four nights. We will be drumming continuously. And during that gathering, every evening, we will have a ceremony for veterans and for military people to welcome them home and asking them to put their prayers in the fire and to have the elders come and pray with them and help them in, in their step back into, into the civilian world. So um, everyone is oh, invited. And that's in Olympia, Washington. Yes. I think my brother lives near there. October 7th through the 10th. Mm -hmm. And um, everyone is invited. We would drum 24 hours a day for mm -hmm. those four days. And, um, you know, lots of people come from all over the place. We had our last one in October 2010 in D.C. And if you go to our website, you can see the video from that one and from the one of 2008 as well. So um, just inviting everyone Great. to be part of this, to help us um, welcome our military home, to help us have conversations while we're there with family members and how to support that person and how to support that family, mm -hmm. you know, and do giveaways and just really honor them up in a good way, you know. That's great. Now, what was the website again? TurtleWomenRising.com. Okay. And we have an email address. It's TurtleWomenRising um, at Live.com. And that's, if people want to contact me, they can contact me there. But if they go to the website, there's lots of information um, it's a free gathering, you know. Um, we will be asking for donations down the road because we got to, you know, pay for our elders and feed them and house sure. them and just take care of the, the logistics of all that. So, uh, but everyone is invited and we certainly hope to see you all there and be part of that. Oh, wonderful. You thank you for the you. invitation. Yes, my brother lives there, so maybe so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for being on the show again. I really appreciate that. 
and uh, keep us posted on what you're working on because I know you're working very hard and I appreciate all the work you've done for the community and for the veterans. Thank you. Thank you, Siwa Pili, for having And thank you for joining us. We'll be right back after a small break. Want to find out what's going on in your community? El Observador is San Jose's bilingual weekly newspaper. Get your free copy today. Thanks for joining us. Now we have with us Linda Woods, and welcome, Linda. And Linda, what tribe are you with? I'm a uh, Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians in uh, in uh, Peshawar Town, Michigan. That's from where I'm Michigan. from. Michigan. Yes. And one of the reasons we w Linda has been on the show before, but we wanted to bring her back because she's leaving. You're going back to Michigan. Yes, I am. Yes, And I you're am. going back with your family. Tell us about where you're going, and then we'll get into uh, <laughs> what <laughs> okay. you're working on. Okay. Um, well, as an elder, uh, we go home. And we always return back to our tribal roots. And I have a lot to learn yet as an elder. Uh, growing up, I wasn't taught a lot of things like a lot of us uh, Native people. And so I'm looking forward to learning my language. I'm looking forward to uh, cultural teachings. I'm looking forward to, um, I want to sing with the uh, ladies' hand drum group. I'd love to do that, mm -hmm. and so there's many things that I oh, want to yeah. do when I'm when I'm back home. And how exciting! Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm thrilled to be going home. Now you're a veteran. Yes, I am. Uh, I served in the United States Air Force, uh, 1962 to 1966. I was in during the early part of the Vietnam era, and I was uh, stationed in uh, Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. This okay. was during the time when it was the civil rights era mm -hmm. and the civil rights movement was very um, active, shall we say. And I, uh, it was very difficult being in the South at that time, mm -hmm. especially for someone like myself, a person of color. Uh, that was when the blacks and the whites were segregated Mm -hmm. And so there were two different signs on doors, bathrooms, over water fountains, and all of that. And I'd never seen anything like that and before. you say, where do I drink? Exactly. Where do I go? Where am I supposed to go? Uh -huh. I don't fit in either one. So <laughs> it was very difficult for me at that time. I bet. I remember when we moved from Pennsylvania to California, and we came cross country, and we stopped at all those places, and it's like... <gasps> Okay, I just won't have a drink of water. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. don't know where to go. It's it was like, very hard. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult. I'd never seen that kind of uh, blatant racism, and then I'd hear all kinds of comments as well. So mm -hmm. it was, it was, um, you know, we were getting into the war, and and uh, it was during the time when President Kennedy was shot, and uh, I think in the '60s there was a lot of turmoil in the nation and we certainly felt it uh, mm -hmm. as we served. So uh, I served with uh, many other women and uh, I was in the communication squadron and um, it was it was uh, it was fun. I still have uh, friends that I'm uh, I still am contact with mm -hmm. and you know once we have uh, buddies you know long lifelong buddies and so um, I'm still uh, in communication with them also. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Now, you've spent a lot of years working with people in recovery. Yes, yes. I'm a social worker. I uh, graduated with my uh, social, uh, social work uh, master's degree right here in San Jose State oh, okay. in 1994. And I did not intend to go to school, really. I wanted to work and it seemed like the Creator had other plans for me. So uh, he brought me back here to go to school and I, I loved it. I just loved it. I ended up in the child welfare uh, part mm -hmm. of social work. Uh, and then when I graduated in 94, I worked for the county here for, for a little bit. And then I was called to go back home again at that time. And uh, I have always worked with uh, people in recovery mm -hmm. from alcoholism and from uh, addictions. Mm -hmm. And 
it's, it's my passion, actually. It's, it's what I love to do the most. Uh, to me, seeing someone who's uh, new in recovery uh, just brings tremendous joy in my heart. I just can't begin to tell you that. Uh, when I was at home in Michigan, I uh, worked as a substance abuse director for my tribe for a little bit, and then I was also a uh, substance abuse director for a little, little Traverse Bay Bands, which is mm -hmm. north of where I'm from. And I was there for about six years, and I, I just loved working with uh, Native people particularly. Mm -hmm. And uh, many years ago, in the 70s, I worked in San Jose here uh, with the uh, Four Winds Lodge, which uh, was started up about, I think it was 1973, I want to say. Mm -hmm. and, and I was on the Alcohol Advisory Board at the Indian Center at that time. And, and then we started Four Winds Lodge. Mm -hmm. And it was like a halfway house for uh, Indian men primarily. And these were street, street uh, guys mm -hmm. and uh, chronic alcoholics. Um, but I don't know, there's something about uh, working with, uh, with uh, people like this that just, it touches my heart deeply. You and see their lives change. It still change. does, yes. It's just powerful. It's a very powerful thing to witness. Are you going to, to continue witness. that type of work when you get, go back to yes, Michigan? Yes, yes. You are. Actually, I already have a job. Oh, you do? Uh, yes, I'm, uh, I'm a consultant and I'm going to be working with uh, a project, a special project it's called the uh, Access to Recovery Project, mm -hmm. and it's in the state of Michigan with uh, Intertribal Council of Michigan, and I'll be working with all of the 12 tribes in Michigan. Oh. And so um, I'm uh, uh, really excited about that. So I'll be doing part of the uh, training, uh, cultural training. Mm -hmm. I'll be doing some uh, what we call recovery coach training and uh, whatever else they want me to do, I'll be happy to do. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So well, I'm real happy about that. something to look that. forward to there. Yeah. That's yeah. really wonderful. Yeah. How do you see the experience um, San Jose versus Michigan? Well, uh, this is a uh, urban setting, and it's very different from working on reservations. And um, the most distinct thing that I see is uh, I learned there that as Anishinaabe people is who we are, which is the three tribes of uh, Ottawa, Chippewa, and Potawatomi tribes were, were considered Anishinaabe people. Okay. And so those are the primary tribes that I serve in, in Michigan. And so those are the folks that I work with uh, pretty much. It's very different working with uh, reservation, if you will, uh, tribal people right on their homeland than it is in the urban setting. In the urban setting, you know, there are multiple tribes here. Uh, Navajo and, and uh, uh, Lakota and, and people from Washington, Oregon, Utah, just all over uh, and find themselves here in the city. And uh, what I see here more than uh, on the reservations is the identity is a little bit um, it's, it's not as distinct, I guess mm -hmm. you could say, as on the reservation. And right. um, so it's very different, very different. But alcoholism and addiction um, is still uh, very much in denial. You know, that's, that's the pattern, you know, that uh, no one wants to get into recovery because mm. things are going well. You know, uh -huh. <laughs> that's not, <laughs> usually it takes some kind of crisis uh. um, to bring people into recovery. And it start, they start, it starts at a very young age, actually. We have um, adolescent treatment programs, uh, both inpatient and outpatient. And we have, um, I've worked with elders, and working with elders is very different than working with an adolescent or working with, uh, say, a chronic uh, street person, mm -hmm. per se. So um, it is, there's a lot of, lot of uh, difference there. And we somehow try to weave our culture into the treatment right. process. It isn't totally the Western model, although we do use the Western model, but it's, it's different um, when you weave the culture in, because then the culture incorporates what we call the uh, seven grandfather teachings into what we're doing. And so 
Uh, we're trying to guide them back into recovery with the mm -hmm. use of our culture. And maybe they'll get involved with singing and drumming mm -hmm. or attending um, uh, gatherings, uh, powwow gatherings or uh, ceremonies. Ceremonies is very big at home. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's, it's exciting work. I, and you I were recently it. honored at the um, Mount Madonna powwow for all your work oh. and River Farewell. And oh my goodness, yeah. I was, um, I was just over the top with that. I, I, I was so overwhelmed. Well deserved. I was so overwhelmed with it. Uh, my friend Leon uh, said he wanted to honor me and I've seen people be honored and I thought, oh, that'll be a nice send off. But the way he did it was something different and I hadn't anticipated. And he had, uh, he escorted me on my left and then on my right with my friend Paul Kirkwood who sings on the southern drum. And uh, Leon said, we're gonna go halfway around the circle and the northern drum is gonna sing you halfway around the traveling song. And then at the uh, top of the circle, we're gonna pause and then the southern drum is going to bring you back to the completion mm. of the circle. And, and before uh, we started, he called me up by my Indian name. And I went up and um, he wrapped me in a Pendleton blanket. And um, I was just overwhelmed. Well, we're out of time. But thank you so much for coming to see us before you leave we wish you well we know you'll have a wonderful time and they're going to love having you there yes. we'll love to see you when you come back to yes, visit in san I jose come so. see us thank you but thank you for this you honor well. of being here thank, thank you, so you much. for coming thank you and thank you for joining us on native voice tv I want to thank Destiny. Where's Destiny? She's out there somewhere. Destiny Reese is visiting from Albuquerque. She was our makeup person this evening. So thanks, Destiny. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next week. Good evening. Indigenous, indigenous, indigenous.